Welcome, everyone. We are back on a Thursday afternoon, morning, wherever you are, uh, at um, live with Dr. McDougall. And I'm Gustavo Tolosa, as usual. You're probably getting tired of seeing me, but you're stuck now with me. And I love it too much to spend this time with Dr. McDougall and you. And I know that everybody logging in now uh, is thinking this. So I'm just going to say it, and I hope. It's okay that Dr. McDougall is not getting tired of hearing the same thing, but we all appreciate so much that uh, Dr. McDougall gives freely of his time. This is a physician and a very generous man that has been practicing medicine for half a century now and written a dozen best-selling books and treated patients, thousands of patients, saved I don't know how many thousands of lives all over the world, and it is our privilege to have him just for us. And like I have said before, I know many other doctors in the plant-based uh, world. I don't see them doing a free webinar every week. And we are just, uh, just very appreciative, Dr. Uh, McDougall, and it's a privilege, and we all welcome you. So how are you doing today in Santa Rosa? Oh, it's good. It's really, it's been warm here. I guess I guess it's been warm in lots of parts of the, yes. of the southwest and the west, but so but there is no people. global warming, right? No, and there's a great healthcare system they just looked at today too. <laughs> I mean, fantastic. Uh, I, being one of the rich, get to be a little richer. So uh, it's just it's just amazing how greedy human beings are. But anyway, we're uh, yeah we're here we're. Uh, Mary and I are doing well and uh, enjoying the summer with the grandkids. We've had them, the three grandsons, Heather's kids, over uh, every day this week so far for a swim. And that, that I'll tell you, Gustavo, you know, I can be kind of dragging around for the day, you know, oohing and on and making excuses for myself <laughs> about why I'm not doing this and, uh, you know, why I have this little ache or pain here. And that those, those three little boys, they're... Uh, 8, 10, and 13, they come over, and every thought except happiness disappears. I, it's amazing. I'm physically, mentally, emotionally, I'm, I feel like a whole different person. So I, I, I'm looking, of, of an, an energy and Oh, happiness. yeah, yeah. yeah and, I've got, and I've got four more grandkids coming up. So, gee, just, just, just for the fun that I have... Uh, possible in my future. I should be around for a long time. <laughs> you well, should. We're, looking, we're looking forward to this afternoon. Over. <laughs> well, very good. Hey, very good. Hey, I, I, know, I know you all have been watching the newspaper. And I Probably some of you have been looking into the politics, which, of course, I mean, how many times can you hear breaking news? I, just, <laughs> I mean, I just don't get it. But anyways, after about the fourth time I've heard the breaking news, I can't take any more politics. No. Uh, so uh, that's been kind of interesting. But also what's been interesting, you say I've been at this for a long time. I have, enjoyably so. Uh, it'll be 2018, it'll be 50 years that I've been in, actually, in medicine. And so now it's 49, and you know, we've done 13 books. And I, I think the reason that uh, you always see a smile on my face and why, you know, I look like I like doing this is because naturally I'm a teacher. I, I've always loved to teach. I, I used to teach anatomy and neuroanatomy in medical school. In addition, that's one of the ways I put myself through medical school. And uh, so I've always been a teacher. So it's just really fun for me to watch people's eyes open, their minds open, and get real excited about important information, not, not unimportant information, but things that make a difference in your life. And if you've, uh, you've been watching last week and the last couple of weeks, you see that things are changing. Uh, the American Medical Association came out and said, regardless of what the BS liars over the last, well, Atkins started it in the 70s, but there was a resurgence of actins in the 90s, and now we have wheat belly and grain brain, and you know, a guy named Grundy, we talked about the lectin idea last week. Uh, these people are coming out uh, left and right, and it's the most bizarre thing in the world. You'd never thought this would have been the case if you'd been 
raised, taught in the 70s about what good nutrition is and why people are dying. In the 70s, they clearly identified animal foods as being the primary killers, uh, heart disease being number one. They talked about diabetes and cancer and so on. You would never thought that it would become to be just the opposite, but it is. I don't think there's a, a listener out there or probably a human being that has any form of education that hasn't been taught the right diet is the paleo diet, which is 55% animals. They could be endangered species, doesn't matter, they just have to be animals. <clears throat> or the low carb diets where you're getting up uh, and almost all the diet is animals or oils. And uh, you live through that. I've lived through that for the past, well, it's been at least 20 years. And you've wondered why in the world, how could this happen? Why, how can people miss it? Well, I believe it's because of uh, the money. It's always because of the money and people's personal eating habits. They always want to justify why pepperoni pizza is a number one food for preventing senility. Uh, you know, that's kind of the way nature is. But I never imagined it could go this far in this day and age of information and technology and people having a good life. I mean, they're dealing with most parts of the world. They're dealing with a little wife and a husband and children, and family and community and so on. Really, I don't know that things have ever been better in my reading of history uh, than they are right now. <clears throat> you would think that people would have time to think about how to make things even better and really tackle the cause of diseases. But that hasn't happened. But this week it kind of did with a spark. There was an article about how most diseases can be prevented by eating starchy foods. Believe that. And then the American Medical Association came out and said, wait a minute, there's no question about this. Saturated fat, which means eggs and dairy and meat, uh, is not healthy. It will make you sick, give you heart disease. And the headlines in the paper focused on how cheese uh, is unhealthy with you. Well, you shouldn't have just left it at cheese. I mean, they talked about all the different uh, animals that people eat being unhealthy. So, you know, there is a, a, a trend out there of the truth being leaked out. And that's good. Uh, but I do understand it, it may not be enough. And the only reason I understand this is I've lived through 40, 40 years, four decades of seeing the truth demolished and uh, the liars winning when I never thought it could have happened. And now it's kind of swinging back in the right direction. Uh, I don't know. Let's just hope we can keep out being out there and talking and telling people the truth so that they can get their health back. I'm, I'm looking forward to that. Well, let's see. Uh, I'm also, I'm also uh, involved, as, as many of you know, I get involved in topics here, the brain. My brain just gets focused on something and wants to know more and more and more and more about it. Well, I'm revisiting the subject uh, probably next week, maybe over the next three weeks. It's going to be the topic of next month's newsletter, which is something to the effect. Well, I'll figure out some tricky to uh, topic title. Uh, something to the effect that aluminum causes Alzheimer's. I wrote, I wrote this newsletter in 2004, so 17 years ago I wrote it. And uh, now I decided I would just update, revisit how people are thinking and what the research says and, you know, how things are going and so on. And the papers these days clearly, unequivocally say that Alzheimer's disease is caused by aluminum, aluminum poisoning, you know, the metal aluminum. And uh, the evidence is even more consistent uh, more uh, calling for action than it ever was to do something about the consumption of aluminum. Well, anyway, I'm going to talk about that next week and the week after. So if you want to get up to date a little bit, there's an article I wrote in uh, the year 2004 on how Alzheimer's disease can be can be uh, prevented and uh, helped now by change in diet, and there's also chelation therapy and so on. But we were going to finish off Gustavo today, and let, I'm going to try and just kind of, kind of make it short. It's a subject that everybody has touched on, mm -hmm. and right. most appropriate too. And it has to do with the last chapter of the GI book, 
which we've been going over for the last few months. Unfortunately, it's not something I could have put on our website for free because it's still copyrighted, but you can buy the book many places. Other books that we've talked about, I've made them available free for you. Could, could just couldn't do that. <clears throat> but anyway, the, the finish off, as I was reading the end of the book about Larry and Louise and their trips through the digest digestion track, digestive track, uh, I got to the last chapter, the one we were to talk about today. I thought, how appropriate to put that chapter in and why not at the end? It's a chapter about uh, human evolution, primate evolution, evolution in the animal kingdom, whatever you want. However, we got from there to here. And ladies and gentlemen, I think it took more than 6,000 years. But we'll just keep that out of the discussion. Uh, yeah, the human being, uh, uh, the gastrointestinal tract is probably where you can make the most connections. The human being is designed as a plant eater. Let's compare carnivores, that means meat eaters, to herbivores, which are plant eaters. And then there's something in between, which is an omnivore. I would call a dog an omnivore. I'd call a cat a, a carnivore. And I would call all my relatives herbivores, or at least they should be. Uh, how does a uh, carnivore, like my cat, how do they cool themselves? How do herbivores cool themselves? I mean, when they overheat. Carnivores don't sweat. Herbivores do. Carnivores pant to cool themselves. Uh, it's a hot day here in June of 2017. As you're out walking around, you're noticing people. How many of them are panting to cool themselves? How many are sweating? Uh, as you sit down to the lunch table today with uh, your friends and coworkers and so on, and you watch them consume their beverage, how do they consume the liquid? Well, think about yourself. What are you going to do with that glass of water in front of you? Are you going to lap it <laughs> like that? I doubt it. What you're going to do is sip it, right? That's what plant eaters do is they sip, carnivores lap. Plant eaters, they um, pers perspire to cool themselves, and, and meat eaters, uh, they pant. That's just the way it is. Uh, the mouth, uh, teeth, and so on, I'm sure it's not too hard to convince you that they are designed as herbivore teeth, plant-eating teeth. And, and your friends go, wait, wait a minute, wait a minute. You're not right, Dr. McDougall. We are really car omnivores. And the proof is, and we've all been taught it, it's because of our dentition. We have four carnivorous teeth. Yeah, these are here. Uh, I know it's kind of hard to see them. I'd probably have to draw a uh, colored pencil on for you. <laughs> Very <see> impressive. <laughs> yeah, I should bring Einstein in here and show him. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. Or, or when I had a dog or a chimpanzee who has 90% of their genes the same as ours. And they're uh, plant eaters, occasional bug or a rodent here and there. You look at, uh, take the trouble to look up what a chimpanzee looks like. And they got few, four huge teeth. And they're clearly on the herbivorous side, plant eating side. You know, a touch arm of boring them, not much. If they're clearly and accepted by you, your friends, your veterinarians, uh, your doctor, your, uh, you know, your, the strongest eating Burger King and McDonald's follower. You got to see that the teeth of human primates are more plant eating oriented than even those of chimpanzees, which are accepted as plant eaters. Uh, amylase is the uh, digestive enzyme in your saliva and in your uh, small intestine. Cat does not produce amylase. Carnivores do not produce amylase. Amylase digests amylose and amylopectin, which is starch. That's why we have that enzyme. Uh, our taste buds. The tip of our tongue tastes not only sugar, which is all I knew about when I wrote that book, this book, in 2007. Not just sugar, 
which is only made by plants. Uh, human primates have a separate taste bud for starch. Yes, it was reported last year that when you block the sweet tasting taste buds, which everybody would clearly say, sweet taste comes from plants, from fruits and other plants, and of course, sugar. Uh, everybody recognized that. I've known that, I'm sure, since grade school. But uh, last year at uh, one of the Oregon universities, I should write it down so I don't get mixed up, uh, probably Oregon State University. But there was a major paper published where they blocked the sweet tasting taste buds and uh, they discovered as a result of blocking these sweet tasty taste buds, another set of taste buds that was just as strong and dedicated towards starch, like bread and pasta and potatoes. And uh, so our taste buds are designed to be starch eaters. A cat, like Einstein, my course favorite cat, uh, a cat has no taste buds for sugar or for starch. They have taste buds for amino acids. Protein. That's what they're designed to eat. Uh, their stomachs are designed to digest protein. They have 10 times the concentration of hydrochloric acid, which digests meat, as does an herbivore. Uh, we have a long, complicated intestinal tract so that we can digest uh, the foods, which are relatively undigestible compared to meat. Plant foods require some digestion. And it had, takes a complicated, tortuous, long path to get the plant foods digested into the proteins, vitamins, minerals, carbohydrates, and the fats that we need. Now, a carnivore or meat-eating animal, they have a short, uh, very tubular, straight light, not, not convoluted with a whole bunch of pockets and so on, intestinal tract so that the remnants of the food can be digested and eliminated quickly. Yes, hands, obviously, these hands are not designed to tear chickens apart. But, but my cat's uh, paws are designed perfectly for the job. Well, let's see, what else? Oh, let me just kind of, I mean, we could go on forever. In fact, I encourage you, there's a... Um, one of our advanced study weekend seminars is on evolution. And it's a brilliantly done piece. And uh, I'll get it up for you here in just a couple of minutes. But uh, it, it, it just wonderful slides. And uh, as a result, it was done at the February 2017 advanced study weekend. Uh, it's well worth looking at. It goes through a tremendous comparative uh, analysis of uh, of uh, plant eaters and meat eaters. Uh, let's see. Oh, one last thing. Oh, I got it. Just one last thing, which I find entertaining because everything of sexual nature is entertaining to the human being. As I mentioned, my three grandkids are coming over this afternoon. So any topic related to between the belly button and the kneecaps is at least worth a giggle. So let me uh, end by uh, this statement about herbivores, plant eaters. The male plant eater has two sacs connecting to the bladder called the seminal vesicles. And the seminal vesicles, they collect sperm from the testicles and prostate secretions from the prostate, and they store them in these sacs, vesicles. I would guess the vesicles uh, contain about one to two ounces of fluid. That's the semen. And only plant eaters have seminal vesicles. Carnivores don't have them. They have a small ejaculate and uh, they have no storage sacs. So one of the characteristics of a plant eating animal, which would be a cow, a horse, primates, etc., is they have these two saccular formations that store semen for ejaculation. Of course, you don't have that story system in an eating animal. Anyway, there are, there, are, there are discussions that could go on forever and ever and ever about the difference between plant eaters. When, when a plant eater tries to eat like a meat eater, 
the obvious consequence is they get sick. Just like I've given many of, the, of you the analogy, what if I decided to feed Einstein potatoes? I mean, the best quality potatoes uh, from Idaho, hand-picked. Einstein would be sick and dead soon because that's not his food. Well, if you eat Einstein's food, in other words, meat, then what's going to happen is you're going to get sick. You can't support normal human health. Anyway, that uh, is a fairly good discussion that's at the end of this book, and it ties so well to the gastrointestinal tract, which means that's, that's how we survive. Our hands have to get the food. Our teeth have to chew the food. Our intestines have to digest the food. And that is probably most clearly brought out in terms of, uh, of evolution. All right. Do we have any questions today? Yeah. Yes, but well, sure we like, do. You know, when, when they argue with folks, they always come out with, you know, well, look at our teeth. And uh, you, you now know that you tell them, well, let's look at our teeth. And they point out, uh, look at our hands. Well, you can point these out to people. I guess, I guess they're still worthwhile. Yes, why not? You've got, you've got to start them at a most basic level. Still, if someone doesn't want to see the truth, they're just not going to see it. <laughs> That's well, Dr. McDowell, we do have a few questions. If uh, someone, some people send them in, and I have some that people are typing here. So, is that okay if we jump into some of these questions? Yeah, right. It is. Okay. Oh, but before that, we have to show you new glasses. Okay. <laughs> oh, you know, oh, you mean those glasses, Gustavo? Okay. <laughs> I'm Everybody, impressed. get ready. We have to do this. I'm sorry, no, we're going to put a You, you may here. think I bought these at, at, at the 10 cent store. And it's also, <laughs> I guess the only reason I even will consider showing you this, because I was just shared this with you. The only yes. reason I consider showing you this is that Dr. McDougall ages two also. Well, and uh, I do in notice a stylish way. No, you know, but pretty gracefully, I'd say pretty gracefully, but yes. uh, one of the things that I've noticed, of course, over the years is my vision, mm -hmm. as happens with most elderly people. Uh, my long distance vision, if I showed you my driver's license, you'll see that I have no requirement for glasses. I've had no LASIK surgery. I've had nothing done to my eyes. Uh, I am able at, uh, at 70 years old, which is, I suppose, unusual or yeah, I certainly not well. as common. I'm able to mm -hmm. pass the driving test still. <clears throat> the reading issue, however, has deteriorated more quickly over the last 10 years, where I started out with readers that I bought at Walmart for $10 a piece. I buy them, those kind of <laughs> readers, because I lose them all the time. So I've got yeah. about 20 pairs of these losers, or, or the lose of these readers, which are losers, uh, around the <laughs> house. <laughs> and I've gone, I've gone from ones to twos for the last, say, three or four years. And it's finally gotten to the point where I was uh, at the eye store getting my, so that you brought it up, I got to share it all. You have to in, show in it. In addition to these $10, $10 glasses, Mary finally talked me into buying this pair of glasses about, uh, about three years ago. So I've had these for three years. They've been twos readers and they are very expensive. Oh, let me yes. tell you, you know, but more than I ever wanted to spend because I knew I'd, I'd lose them, but I've had them for three years. Uh, so uh, we were in a, getting the frames adjusted on our glasses yesterday. And I said, you know, I just can't take this. I can't read the newspaper as well as I used to. And my favorite cartoon, Bizarro, by Dan Perrault, which I read every day, is a good friend of mine. It's getting harder and harder to read it without putting two pairs of glasses on. So, all right, Gustavo. There we go. I, I finally broke down. I was in the eye store. I wanted a $10 pair of glasses that I could see out of. But all they had was these. Well, uh, and okay. they weren't they weren't $10. They were these are Elton John glasses, I think. What yes. do you think? You have to start taking <laughs> piano lessons so you can <laughs> you think, you think, maybe, maybe people have respect for me because I I have these glasses. What do you think? No, anyway, they, they, they were cool. uh, not not extremely expensive, but they were a lot more expensive than my, I'm a, And the other reason I bought, I'll tell you, you know, just to be honest with you, because you guys are friends. 
is I think I can find them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, when you got 20 pairs of glasses around and they're all the same framed color. That's right. That's right. You know, I, I, go, I pick up and put on 10, 10 pairs of glasses sometimes before I find the ones that still work. I should just that throw them want. away or just buy ones in different colors. Well, those you can find. They're almost fluorescent. <laughs> yeah, so far, I haven't lost them. So far, I have, uh, I've been able to find them. And well, by, thank by you. The for way, I, by the way, I can read the Bizarro cartoon really easy now. It'll keep you anything to keep yeah. you happy. Uh, oh, yes, it's it, it's important though, uh, Gustavo, because a lot well, of people, yeah. as they get older, and I see this in my friends and patients, they lose contact. You're right, quality of life. Yes, they lose contact because they can't hear what people right. are saying, and you know they can't read. Uh, then they can't watch. The, they become you know, isolated. Yeah, yeah they isolated. do. And, and it's really hard for us as we get older to admit. That we need to buy glasses and stronger or glasses. Hearing aids or, or hearing aids, whatever it yeah. is. Yes. Yeah. But it's inevitable unless you take uh, the earlier way out, which is to die early. No. You do that. <laughs> uh, you know, it, everybody's in the same game. Yeah. We're so all if you're going to live to be in your 70s, 80s, and maybe fortuitously into your 90s, I read today about a guy who's 87 who's like travels to 60 countries over the last 10 years. He's was in our travel section of the paper day. He looked good. He was 80, 87 years old. He looked good. Looked like he was having fun. Looked like he was strong. And, uh, you know, if that is what life gives you, and certainly taking good care of yourself will make a difference. And with a few aids here and there, like glasses and hearing aids and maybe a magnifying glass in your backpack. So, uh -huh. <laughs> you know, and you enjoy life into your 90s. And of course, everybody hits, reads the newspaper item. But are you to the age yet? Will you read the obituaries? <laughs> not, not yet. But <laughs> not yet. Well, Gustavo, you're still a young man. Will you get to be the age where you read? I haven't started reading them yet either. Okay. So I well, know that's a sure sign. That, that is that, a sign that you can see that there is a last birthday coming. <laughs> well, Doctor Magnolia, yeah. thank you for showing. Thank you. Appreciate well, it. Thank people. Right. I, I guess. I should. I have a pair of sunglasses that have about the same standout. That's right. Features to them, and besides that, nobody will steal these. Oh no, no, that's for sure. Well, here we go. I have a few questions for you. So the first question is: I had diverticulitis last December and ended up in the hospital for one day. I stopped meats, eggs, oils. I already did not have any dairy products or processed foods. Still, most often than not, I feel as if my stomach is full even without eating. Anything I eat, it can be a fruit, a potato, just anything makes me feel my stomach is full, and I usually burp as if the food did not agree with me. Nothing seems to make me feel well. What do you think is going on? Well, I, I, just the text that you read me makes me think that the... Uh, the writer uh, is having these problems only post diverticulitis and had no surgery that was identified. So uh, tying it to the diverticulitis is very difficult for me. We talked about diverticulitis a couple of um, webinars ago when I gave you the talk about, <clears throat> about the uh, lower intestine and how when you just put small amounts of matter in the large intestine, because you hardly eat any fiber. There's no fiber in any animal product. Fiber is non-digestible carbohydrate. Carbohydrates are only made by plants. And uh, plants, some of the carbohydrates made by plants, the, our intestine can digest. Other carbohydrates uh, are undigestible, indigestible. And uh, as a result, they pass all the way through into the large intestine and make a big mass of stu stool almost stool. Uh, the effluent from the small intestine goes into the large intestine and there, uh, that matter is dehydrated and turned into what eventually is a stool. So um, <clears throat> what happens, how you get diverticular disease, which by the way was non-existent in Dennis Burkett's world in Uganda, uh, where he served as the uh, head of ministries of health for 17 years, and he's the man who turned my life around, opened my eyes in 1971. So back in rural Africa and Uganda, as a matter of fact, I had 
a patient in the last program from Uganda. And we had a, a little bit of conversation about how life was when he was a, a young boy and how he ate exactly the McDougal diet and how nobody was overweight and so on. Well, anyway, getting back to the uh, diverticulosis, which is what the pouches are called. When you squeeze at small diameters, remember if you, if you eat a lot of fiber, you squeeze at a big diameter. You eat no fiber, the large intestine squeezes at a small diameter. The law of Laplace, which is a law of physics, says when you make this squeezy motion at a small diameter to move things along, you have to create very high pressures. And so with a very high pressure, uh, pops out a little balloon. And we call that a diverticula. So this is diverticular disease. If it's just diverticular disease or diverticulosis, the problem associated with it is bleeding because a blood vessel lies right next to the little pouch. That's where it breaks out next to a blood vessel. And sometimes these become infected like, like appendicitis. When the opening to this balloon gets closed by irritation from what's in the bowel, then the... Uh, contents of the pouch get infected, we have diverticulitis. Now, both of the problems associated with diverticular disease, common problems which are bleeding for diverticulosis and infection for diverticulitis, which can be quite serious, can result in abscesses and even death. So it needs to be taken care of. Uh, both of these uh, consequences can be stopped. I mean, you, these are early studies in the 1970s and certainly not great studies, but why is anybody going to study anything that doesn't produce a ton of money? Um, <clears throat> that showed that the bleeding episodes in people with repeat bleeding episodes with diverticulosis and those who have uh, repeat attacks of infection, diverticulitis, you can stop that just by adding fiber. And in the study I'm thinking of right now, uh, they just added bran to the diet, which is an artificial way of raising the fiber in the stool is Miller's bran. It's, uh, you know, just bran. What is uh, the best way to do is to put the right foods in the stomach, which are naturally high in fiber. So that's all happening in the large intestine. I mean, you can have these in the small intestine, even in the stomach and esophagus, these diverticuli, but they're due to a different mechanism. So um, having the diverticular problem, then you're telling me that you can't, feel anything but full, even if you eat a little bit, it just doesn't connect as to how the two would be related. Maybe you have a mass in there as a result of the diverticular disease. Maybe the diverticuli ruptured and you formed an abscess, which is healed or partially healed, but it left a big mass, which uh, is compressing your stomach. That's a possibility. Uh, maybe you're chronically ill. And when you're, when you're, chronically ill, and it could be from chronic diverticulitis, you lose your appetite. Regardless, it's not right. You're supposed to be hungry. You're supposed to eat. Your weight's supposed to be stable. That'd be a big clue to me as a doctor is if you were losing weight and your appetite was that suppressed. That would be uh, certainly um, enough indication to see a doctor and to ask for some uh, non-invasive investigation. And this would be like an abdominal, abdominal echo, echogram where they put sound waves in your abdomen and they can visualize the organs or any masses to see if anything's going on there. Uh, unfortunately, once you get into the business, you, know, you ask the question, they're going to give you an answer. Uh, there are a lot more tests that could follow. They may be appropriate. They may have been helpful. They also are very costly and can be deadly. Uh, and these would be the endoscopes that are passed, uh, usually under uh, sedation or anesthesia. Uh, endoscopes, in other words, tubes passed down the throat or up the bottom. Uh, we used to do these uh, with uh, a barium contrast material. Before these scopes were invented, which are useful, but they have their own problems and they're very costly. What we would do is somebody came in with complaints like yours. We didn't have the echo back then. But if we didn't say feel anything, I can't remember. Maybe we put, well, I might have taken a few x-rays. Uh, certainly felt the abdomen, see if we could feel a mass that would keep you feeling full all the time. And uh, then what we do is a, an x-ray, a barium contrast x-ray, 
called a barium swallow, and that would look at the esophagus and the stomach and see ulcers in the stomach and duodenum. And you could do a barium swallow with a follow through which means that they, then they'll look at the small intestine and see how that passage is and take x-rays of that. And uh, the other test we used to do was a barium enema, where you take really just, you know, clean a person out with a preparation uh, and then take a tube and uh, infuse barium in, into the large intestine. And it was kind of through like a backward flow and take pictures there. Now, you know, those tests, gave some great information at a little expense, expense and at a little risk, but they're, they're archaic. Why? Not because they're not useful, but because we have a whole other business that took over back in the 19, early 1980s, and that was the endoscopy business with fibroscopy. So they could make tubes where they'd bend light, you could take and, and bend around curvatures and still see an image Wonderful uh, technology, wonderful advancement, been of great help, but it's also been of great cost and killed quite a few people. Anyway, the bottom line, without going on as to what else you need done, is you're not feeling right. You related to the diverticulitis. I can't, I just unless there's some obstructive mass there, you're chronically sick. And you need to ask the doctor the question, you know, is there something more seriously wrong with me that I should be paying attention to? Right, right. Okay, well, thank you, Dr. McDougall. Someone who attended your 10-day program and was very happy wrote to us and said that she attended the 10-day program last June, and at the end of the program, her, her cholesterol was measured, um, and um, it was uh, fasting, and it was 196. And then this month, she went to the doctor, and they, they uh, took blood from her to uh, measure the cholesterol, but it was non-fasting, and it's a little bit higher, it's 228. And she or he, I don't know if it's a lady or, not, or a man, is wondering if the results get affected, whether it, the person is fasting or not. Not much. Not but not cholesterol. Blood okay. sugar and triglycerides are affected greatly. Those are routine tests that we get by. Um, by the time you eat, and that's why we have you stop eating at eight o'clock, because of those two tests primarily. Uh, the influence on cholesterol it could be there because, say you ate and the triglycerides are fat and the blood went up. Uh, these triglycerides also mix with proteins and cholesterol, uh, called and the form particles called lipoproteins, uh, LDL, HDL particles. Anyway, that cholesterol doesn't run around in the blood all by itself. It runs around in packages which contain protein and fat. And so it could raise it a bit. Uh, I would check the triglycerides that were done on the two occasions and see whether or not they went up. I mean, mm -hmm. they may, that may give you, give you some uh, comfort uh, in terms of uh, that's why they went up. But I'll tell you, most likely, try not to take offense. Most likely you're not eating as strictly as you were during the 10-day program. Uh, mm -hmm. That's almost always the problem. And the first thing that I would ask you if we talk to by email, which I do to, with my patients quite often, uh, if we talk to, uh, that, that's the, the first thing I, I would ask you is, you know, how simple and how strict are you being with the program? And uh, the usual answer I get when people are honest is, I eat better than I used to. Yeah, but better than you used to it could mean an awful lot of things. A lot of things. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and I would say, look, just do a test. Uh, pick, like Mary's just put on her crockpot, as we talk about so many times. <laughs> just put on her crockpot and some uh, brown beans. I don't know what they are, but she, she buys all kinds of interesting beans. I just decide that for the next seven days is plenty. But if you want to take it to the maximum, it's six weeks. You can see six in six weeks, almost all cholesterol lowering through any change, diet, starting statins, whatever. And, uh, you know, be simple in your diet. Be very strict in your diet. Eat potatoes and beans or rice and beans. And uh, don't go out to eat with any of your friends. Uh, those uh, Hershey candy bars that, you didn't say you'd give up before you went to the 10-day program. That's the one thing you didn't say you were going to give up. Uh, you get rid of those. 
Uh, right. So anyway, I think it's mostly a matter of strictness. And the way I would, uh, the, the next question I would do to confirm that for me, you know, even if the patient said, no, no, I've been perfectly strict, as I would say, because most of my patients need to lose weight. Well, you were in the program, I forgot, a year ago, and you were uh, 60 pounds overweight. How much weight have you lost? Well, I lost five pounds during the program, doctor. And please, if you're, whoever wrote in, if you're taking this personal, please don't. Uh, I don't know who you are, and uh, I'm not trying to be offensive at all. But uh, I lost five pounds during the program. And when I went home, I lost another five pounds. But somehow I haven't lost any since. Or I've gained those 10 back or whatever. Look, the diet always works. You know, it's not like uh, maybe it's right for my body type or my blood type or my taste bud desire today. You know, you, naturally it makes sense that you should eat what you like. That's why the body likes it. Well, if the food was natural, uh, I'd offer you all of the, uh, all the cow blood you want to drink. You know, all of the, uh, the pig muscle you want to eat. You wouldn't need it. You wouldn't like it. Uh, you naturally like sugar. Why? Because fruit's part of your diet. And starches do taste sweet. And you naturally like starch because you have taste buds because that's what you're supposed to eat. And um, the idea that that mm -hmm. people, especially children, this used to be a big topic in the pediatric literature, will naturally you present a, an array of foods in front of them and they'll naturally pick what's good for them. You know, if they're deficient in something like protein, they'll eat you know, more Kentucky Fried Chicken, the lean one. It's complete nonsense. People have these taste buds. They would respond properly if the proper environment was around. But because of the manipulation of the environment right. by our desire and manufacturers and restaurants and so on to make it even more intently pleasing, has gotten us into a situation where everybody's sick. Everybody in our society is sick. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The exceptions you can count it on, you know what I'm talking about. I know. I mean, uh, Dr. McDougall, this last week, three people that I know closely, uh, some of them are employees of mine, but uh, I mean, they ended up in the hospital. And it's like I, everywhere I turn around, it's, it's, people are sick. And yeah. there is that connection between what goes in the mouth and what happens in the body, somehow, if these are intelligent people, that doesn't click. And well, it's so frustrating. You know, I, I used to believe that. In fact, I believed even more of what my parents taught me, which is what your parents taught you and all your parents taught you. And that is, there are only two important nutrients. And as long as you satisfy those two, which are protein and calcium, and you're going to have a great life. Right. Yeah. That's what we're taught. And we're taught by the protein and calcium industries. And you're stuck with your genes because everything that happens to you is because it's, it's in your family. It's uh, in the family, and it is. And what is in the family, about. actually, is those recipes that are passed on that are keeping the family sick. What do they eat in Argentina, Gustavo? You're going to Argentina. Well, yeah. Year. Well, well um, let, let me first tell you, I visited there once. <laughs> Mary and I went there about 20 years ago, and I gave in, and I said, all I can do is eat the Atkins diet. I can't find anything to eat except for a few canned vegetables and the Atkins diet. So I'll eat the Atkins. I just joked. <laughs> I didn't eat the Atkins. I have to say, Argentina was uh, uh, one of the most difficult places I have eaten. And, of course, I went from Chile to Argentina. Yeah. And, and I really think maybe Chile was worse. Than Argentina. Well, you know, Argentina you, was pretty tough. when you're stuck there and you don't have a, a house or an apartment and you have to eat out, it is impossible, pretty much. But otherwise, people, I mean, they have markets outside and markets. I mean, people do eat a lot of vegetables and fruits, but yes, it's meat based. And so I think it's gotten better. People are getting more conscious now about vegetarian and plant-based, but I'm going there and I am not staying in a hotel or in any, I'm, I rented a place and I'm going to cook my own meals because it is difficult. Uh, San Pablo, it's the big, biggest city Same. in Argentina. That's in Brazil, yeah. yeah. 
all in Brazil. Okay. Yeah, Buenos Aires and my city, yeah, Cordoba, is, yeah. are, you know, are in Argentina. But yeah, it's the, these are countries that are, you know, meat based. You know, my my dad, my dad uh, uh, went to Brazil. Mm -hmm. uh, he was with the Ford Motor Company, and uh, it was one of the great things that happened in him, to him and his life. And my mother went to. Uh, they went to right. work for the Ford division. And uh, he stayed there a year. They treated him well. I mean, it was completely different than my dad was used to. You know, he got cars to drive him around and uh, worked at the Ford Motor Company. And uh, first year, uh, he told me, he says, son, he said, I'm the oldest man alive here. And he was about 60, 65. He says, everybody else is dead. Uh, he said, you know, it's not hard for me to see why uh, a meal as they come out and they serve plates of meat. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's a meal. Yeah. <laughs> and and he, they, you know, my mother lived in an apartment there, so they did their cooking on their own. Right. But, uh, you know, he was he, he from Detroit, Michigan, raised on uh, the good old American diet, was shocked not only by the amount of meat that they served yeah. there, yeah. But by the effect on the people, he said, "There aren't any males my age here." It is. It is. I, uh, I have. I have seen it improve, but it's still. Um, it's still difficult. Uh, Dr. McDougall, talking about eating, would you just say a few words about? Someone was asking about what do you think uh, of eating once per day? Is that something that is uh, negative? I I think that'd be okay. I don't think how many times a day or what time of the day you eat makes a whole lot of difference. Uh, it's what you eat. Say you were on the night shift, and uh, so you had to work from midnight to eight in the morning. Uh, you'd get adapted to that. Uh, there's some, of course, neuroadaption that has to take place and some things that never really totally adapt uh, because of the night-day issues. But people do. They, they adapt. Uh, uh, when everybody else, well, everybody else except those who live in China, they're eating at the same time of the day as you are in Detroit. But, uh, you know, people adapt. Uh, they do well. Uh, it's, it's, it's what you eat. And as far as the number of times you eat, if you eat more frequently, say 14 times a day, you'll lose weight more efficiently than, say, somebody that eats once, twice, or three times a day. And... Uh, Part of that is because if you eat many times a day, you get uh, the fuel in, the body realizes that you've eaten. Uh, it doesn't really have to store any any extra of the food because it knows it's going to get some more food later. So it doesn't have to convert the carbohydrates into fat or shove as many fats from the food into your body fat. And uh, if you measure the insulin levels, the insulin drives fat into fat cells and it's a response to eating. If you measure the total 24-hour insulin levels on people and you look at those who eat, say, 14 times a day, the area under the curve, the 24-hour insulin production, is less than those who gorge or eat uh, one, two, or three times a day. They have a total insulin production that's greater. Plus, if you only eat once, twice, three times a day, the body takes in a large amount of food and it realizes that uh, it has to store because you're not going to be eating again for another 12, 14 hours or 24 hours. It has to store some of that energy. And so its storage mechanisms are uh, more active, uh, you know, uh, uh, are uh, uh, doing more of what they have to do so you can make it the whole 24 hours. So I would say um, well, there are some advantages to being a grazer, a nibbler. Mm -hmm. And there are some disadvantages to being a gorger. However, in terms of overall importance as far as your health, your longevity, uh, I don't really expect a big difference. Mm -hmm. Right, right. And Dr. McDougall, this is an interesting question that hasn't been asked many times, so maybe it's the first time, but I have actually wondered this too. So uh, we're talking about the, the stomach and eating and knowing that, you know, we, even though we, we can wash vegetables really well sometimes we don't know if we're eating parasites um what ha, can parasites be treated or do we be concerned at all about this or well parasites can be treated a giardia i see giardia quite often and uh amoeba infection 
is uh, quite common, particularly uh, among folks who live in uh, yeah. in the southern part of the U.S. Mm -hmm. Lots of amoeba. The giardia is, I mean, if your kid goes to school, likely he has or has had giardia. <clears throat> and uh, these parasites can be treated with some very powerful, toxic, and occasionally deadly drugs like flagell. Mm -hmm. uh, th th that's a really a big decision. Say you you bring your child into the pediatrician or the doctor with complaints of stomach aches and maybe some diarrhea for the last two or three weeks and just doesn't seem to want to go away. And the doctor says, oh, we'll get ova and parasites, ova being the eggs of the parasites, and parasite examination. And they'll take samples of your stool and they'll look at them under the microscope with a stain maybe. And they'll say, yep, this, this, this person has Giardia. It's not hard to pick up, not hard to identify. It's routinely done by uh, basically every lab <clears throat> or they have amoeba. And uh, you go back to the doctor and the doctor says, well, we have to give this powerful antibiotic. And uh, I've been in that situation patient-wise and family-wise. And unless the person was extremely sick, which I don't ever remember seeing, I said, look, it'll pass. It will pass, uh, and it does. The body deals with the uh, parasite, and the pa person becomes comfortable again. Sometimes the parasite's eliminated. Sometimes they just develop a happy relationship. So uh, I thought the question was going to be, if you consume vegetables or foods from the ground or any place, they're going to have various environmental contaminants, right. pesticides, herbicides on them. Uh, they are going to have bacteria, and if a, a farm worker pooped on your on your cabbage, it's going to have all kinds of bacteria and parasites on it. So what do you do about that? Well, you know, they're supposed to wash them after they leave the field, but of course you and I don't trust that. Uh, washing's good. Well, what do you wash them with? The solution to pollution is dilution. Maybe I should say that one more time because I love it. I, learned it I love that. Yeah. I learned it 50 years ago. The solution to pollution is dilution. <laughs> In other words, uh, you just, just uh, a lot of water flushing. Well, should I put in uh, chlorine in the water or some special cleanser I bought over the internet for $15 a bottle? I just put one tablespoon in a glass of water and then wash it. No. The solution to pollution is dilution. Just wash it. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's the best you're going to do. Your body can tolerate a tremendous amount of uh, exposure. It's built to do that. Of course, you want to minimize it. You don't want to purposely go out and eat from an arsenic-tainted rice field that was tainted by arsenic when they were trying to kill the bull weevil when they were growing cotton there in their land in Louisiana. You don't want to eat. You don't eat contam uh, any kind of vegetable products uh, grown in heavy metal contaminated uh, soils. It's a real problem. Now mm -hmm. you ask me how to avoid that. I guess you have to go to the packager of these uh, products, call them up, tell them, do you analyze your rice or your et cetera, potatoes or rice or vegetables? Do you analyze them? somewhere along the production line of collection and washing, do you analyze them for the content of heavy metals, of dangerous uh, metals? And, uh, you know, hopefully they tell you, yeah, we take care of that. Or do you analyze the soils to make sure that they're not contaminated heavily with thallium or cesium or, you know, lead or arsenic or whatever? All these things are, are accumulated in vegetables. They're some of them are, and particularly the, the really good vegetables, like the cruciferous ones, you know, the, the ones, uh, the, the broccoli and the, the kale and the, uh, the other green leafy vegetables, they're called hyperaccumulators because they are so efficient at taking large amounts of dangerous elements out of the soil. And I mentioned thallium, I mentioned cesium, uh, I can mention a whole bunch of others and accumulating them and storing them in their parts that you eat. So these questions are essential. Uh, they should be asked. 
they have been asked uh, not well I'd have to review what's been done but we're going to talk about aluminum and Alzheimer's disease over the next three weeks or so maybe two maybe Good. one you know. okay all right. And, 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 and the contamination of our world with aluminum and uh, all these metals is just a, it's, it's an accepted thing that you're to eat polluted mm -hmm. food. Right. Right. Well, Dr. Michael, how about one more question and then we'll probably need to close. And well, we, uh, we can, that'll be good. We have a, we have yes, a couple sure. more weeks together before Dr. Right. Lyle joins us. And, yes. and we have a, Let's see. We well, we do have one ten day program in August. It's probably full, but you can check. I will, yeah, I will. I will be there, so it'll be. But exciting. in September, you'll. Be, yeah, that's right. You will be there. In September, yeah. we have uh, an intensive weekend. Yes, that's right. And you know what you could do is you could tell us how interested you'd be in going on a, another McDougal adventure vacation. Uh, Mary and I put these on for almost 30 years, uh, these McDougal adventures. And we've gone to all, all kinds of places. Uh, our trips are probably limited now to Hawaii. Uh, but uh, we had 120 people last time. The interest seems to be great. But uh, I guess we need to be encouraged more to run more of these trips because the weekends that we run, the intensive weekends we run, like the one in September, and the 10-day programs are really, uh, they're our core business. I mean, that's really what we love to do is that kind of education. And right. taking people to Hawaii for a vacation or Costa Rica or Panama or Belize or Galapagos and all kinds of places we've taken people. It's been fun. It uh, has been an awful lot of work at uh, more risk than we have to take in terms of uh, having people with us yeah, at our clinic. That's right. So, it, you know, we I guess we need to hear of uh, some interest that you have. And probably the best way to do that is to write office at drmcdougal.com. And, you know, serious inquiries only, because we're not going to turn our direct direction back towards vacations. by just you saying, yeah, I'd like to go, but I don't have the money. Or right. I'd like to go, but I don't have the time. Well, I know everybody would like to go, particularly if we paid for the trip for you. <laughs> right. <laughs> you, know, you don't have to tell Mary and I anything new. You'd love to go to Hawaii with us. Just send my first class ticket <laughs> to this address. Uh, no, but anyway, well, that's something we're kind of debating as to when to do the next adventure trip mm -hmm. or even if to do one. But we have a, a, a September weekend. You don't want to miss. It'll, it'll fill out. Yeah, and, yes. Uh, August is probably full, and December will get full really quick. We want to see you. Let's take advantage of that. And uh, also, um, also, I want to mention to people, because, of course, we have always more questions than, than we can cover in an hour. You have in your website this amazing feature where people type uh, just one word if they want to know yeah. whatever. And all of your articles and your videos come out, uh, come up. And uh, I think people forget about this feature. It's wonderful. They, they, it's they do, or they don't use it, or they don't know about it. But the search engine it's uh, pretty much answers every question. I'll every get, I'll get, question, yeah. You know, I, I get probably, oh, I don't know, probably maybe 50, 100 emails a day. <clears throat> and I remember your names when you write me and ask me <laughs> questions. <laughs> And sometimes after the third question that easily they're going to find it on the website. Yeah. I say, I say, look, have you tried the search engine? You know, they're just too lazy or yeah. they don't know about it. Right. Excuse right. Me, I, I have time to answer really uh, unaccessible questions, but put a little effort into it first, please. Yeah. Before yeah. you uh, give me an email, because I'm going to write you back and I'm going to be nice when I write you back. But there's going to be a point when I'm going to write you back and I'm going to say, enough, enough. <laughs> yeah, yes. It's, uh, you all have worked so hard on this website. It's just, it's truly amazing. So I want to, you know, everyone, make sure you go to drmcdougal.com. That is my rice maker right there. <laughs> All right. Well, well, then it's definitely time to go. The alarm went off. It's time for lunch. Well, thank you. I do have some of the other questions that we haven't covered, and we will try them for our next. Uh, so don't give up on us. We'll, we'll get to your questions. Okay. 
And uh, thank you, fun. Dr. Mancudo. Yeah, as always. Thank you, Gustavo. Nice I'll, you. Well, I'll talk to you from Argentina next week. I will be here still next week. Oh, still here? Okay. Uh, so I will be in Dallas still, even though I want to leave right now, but I have to wait. Really? It's you winter like in Argentina and it's going to be quite cold when I get there, but it's fine with me. I like winter. Okay. Well, I hope you have a great week, Dr. McDougall and Mary and your family and enjoy your grandkids. Well, the grandkids, uh, you know, it's hot here and the pool's fun and they will be out for a lot. All right. So, good. Very good. I will. I will talk to you. Talk to you next Thursday. And folks, have a good week. This is really simple. <laughs> it's really it's simple. simple, and it costs nothing. All right. Goodbye, Goodbye everyone. Pleasure. I'll see you next week.